Good morning. Good morning, counsel. May it please the court. My name is John Pucci, and I represent Thomas Petrolati in this matter. This case presents a collection of undecided constitutional issues, which this court could wade into. But under longstanding jurisprudence from the SJC, it has deferred consideration of those kinds of issues when a decision can be made based on statutory, narrower statutory grounds. And so I would submit that the court's consideration of the issues at hand should begin by a close examination of the statute in play, Mass General Law 211, Section 3. There are- You reference in your materials that this is really uncharted legal territory. This, what the independent counsel is doing here with respect to subpoenaing someone who happens to be in another branch. You're saying that's uncharted? It's uncharted. I could find no evidence that it had happened in other instances. And- Well, certainly we have, even in my lifetime, the investigation into the conduct of judges at the Boston Municipal Court, the so-called Sugarman Report, Sugarman Investigation, in which 55 individuals were deposed, including sitting legislators, prior legislators. But I don't think any, there's any record that the issues that we have raised, I have raised for Mr. Petrolati, were litigated in that proceeding or in the Troy case, which is a prior proceeding of some similar nature. I just simply don't think the issues were ever litigated. And for that reason, they are uncharted, this is uncharted, undecided legal territory. But counsel appointed by this court on other occasions has conducted investigations of a very similar nature and subpoenaed individuals in the other branch to ask them questions about their knowledge of potential misconduct within the judicial branch. I believe that's the case. Unchallenged, though. Does Mr. Petrolati agree that the fact that he's a legislator doesn't per se protect him against all subpoenas? That is, that he could be subpoenaed in connection with a contract action between two private parties or a tort action or criminal case? Yes, we concede that. If you, yes. So you agree whatever immunity to testify that he has relates only to his functioning as a legislator? I do not. Well, so if he's not immune from a subpoena in a tort or a criminal or another civil case, what is his immunity here that you're claiming? I believe that the inquiry here is being conducted under the second paragraph of 211.3. And the subpoena power of independent counsel under that paragraph is limited to members of the judiciary. Why? Because you have to start with the first paragraph of 211.3. If you look at the first paragraph of 211.3, it specifically gives the court general superintendence over all courts of inferior jurisdiction and over corporations and individuals. It is an extraordinarily expansive provision of general superintendence to this court. But it's limited, it's limited on its very precise terms to the correction of errors and abuses in matters before the inferior courts. So if we were conducting an investigation into an alleged bribe that a judge took, we could not conduct the deposition of the person who paid the bribe? No, I think you can if, because that would fall into, conceivably would fall into the first paragraph of 211.3. It would be an inquiry into an error or abuse in an inferior court. And as such, the first paragraph gives you subpoena power over corporations and individuals. And I would submit it gives you subpoena power over any entity that could conceivably come within the constitutional jurisdiction of this court. You don't think that the language about you may issue such writs, summons, etc. as may be necessary or desirable for the furtherance of the, for furtherance of justice, etc. would include, I mean, you can obviously have factual issues about is it necessary and desirable for this case, and you make that argument. But in terms of raw power, why doesn't that incorporate this? Because the legislature in paragraph one gave the court virtually complete power, and it did not incorporate the same language in paragraph two. It simply isn't in that paragraph under which this independent counsel investigation is being conducted. So I take it you're saying that because the, quote, abuse that we're investigating did not arise out of a 
out of a judicial proceeding, but it, it may involve the judiciary, but it did not involve a particular proceeding. Um, the subpoena power uh, does not apply. Correct. And that's exactly what paragraph one says. It, it cabins this court's, it, it actually doesn't cabin the court. It gives the court vast jurisdiction when it is addressing abuses and errors in courts of inferior jurisdiction. So if there was a bribery investigation, let's say a case was tried, a verdict, it goes all the way up on appeal, it's affirmed, and there is an extraordinary motion under paragraph one concerning a bribe that fixed that case then I would submit you have jurisdiction in that instance under paragraph one to subpoena anybody, any individual, any corporation, any entity to correct and prevent that error in abuse which occurred in the inferior court. But yeah. paragraph two does not include such jurisdiction. When the, when the legislature gave you the authority, the authority to issue uh, subpoenas to third parties, to individuals and corporations in paragraph one. It did not use that language in paragraph two. So does the question then become whether probation is part of the courts? I don't believe so. I believe under paragraph, you could have some abuse, uh, I suppose, relating to paragraph one in the, in the, in the uh, some matter in, that occurred in inferior jurisdiction. I suppose you could have that, but paragraph two, is the paragraph which has to do with the administration of justice. And under paragraph two, you, we can issue writs, summonses, and other processes necessary uh, or desirable uh, in, to secure the proper administration, proper and efficient administration of justice. I'm, it, I'm really not sure why that you say that limits the processes to in-house processes. Because summoning only people within the judicial branch. I don't see that it says that. Because it does not include the language in the paragraph above that broadens the court's ability to bring anybody in to any inquiry. <clears throat> Furthermore, the second paragraph by nature, by virtue of its nature, has to do with the administration of the courts, which would inherently be mostly internal. But not entirely at all. It uh, need not be entirely. I mean, much of what the courts do is interact with the public. Um, and so whenever you're going to have a problem with the, almost whenever you'll have a problem relating to the administration of the courts, uh, you're going to have issues relating to the interaction between uh, court officials and the public. But I would, I would submit as we look at the language of paragraph one and paragraph two, I simply don't think you can put them together and say that the, that the subpoena power in two is the, is the same as the subpoena power in one, which is specifically broad and unlimited, when they did not include that power in the language of paragraph two, which you, brings us here today. You've got, I mean, there, there's sort of three issues, it seems to me. One, I think the, the um, uh, special counsel would say that this investigation is under both paragraphs. So there's that issue, whether paragraph one applies to this to begin with. Uh, paragraph, the second issue is whether it's either A or not A. I mean, whether they are mutually exclusive, in, as you are arguing, um, the two paragraphs. And the third is, quite apart from section three of chapter 211, whether there is some inherent power anyway, right? Well, the, there's cert the court certainly has independent inherent constitutional power of general superintendency. But I think that it should be read in concert and to be coincident with the powers you have under 211.3. I think the best way to understand 211.3 is it effectively codifies the constitutional collection of powers that this court has. But, but the, the, it seems to me that the, the language in the second paragraph, in, in, uh, at least in some respects, is broader than the language in the first paragraph, which arguably uh, may focus on proceedings, errors and abuses therein, if no other remedy is expressly available. So they're, they're, they're talking about, uh, I, the first paragraph may very well be talking about particular cases. The second paragraph seems to be broader in the sense that it talks about the, superintend the general superintendents and the, and the administration of all courts, which encompasses personnel uh, decisions the deployment of personnel, uh, the promotion of personnel, uh, the hiring of personnel. 
And isn't that exactly what this hearing is about, or at least what the, uh, what, what the uh, special master's hearing is about? It's about the, the hiring and the promotion of court personnel. It is. And doesn't that fall within the administration of courts? I, it does. And it does. And so we need to look to paragraph two. And uh, I, perhaps I'm repeating myself, but I think that the issue under paragraph two is, is the, your subpoena power more limited than it is under paragraph one? And I would simply suggest that the legislature knew how to say you can subpoena corporations and individuals, included it in paragraph one, and intentionally, intentionally delete it in paragraph two, which makes perfect sense for this reason. Under paragraph one, uh, any third party could be a party, any, anybody could be a party to a piece of litigation before the court. So all litigation is going to inherently involve, whether in, court, in courts of uh, 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 inferior jurisdiction, is going to inherently involve third parties. If you're going to straighten out a problem in a piece of litigation under paragraph one, you will have to have third parties participate in that process. You have to have that power because those are the parties that were before the court involved in the proceeding. So you have to have expansive, vast power of all individuals and all corporations. It's not necessarily the same in paragraph two, which has to do with the administration of the courts. May I, then, if we agree with you, do, does that mean we conclude that the special master does not have the authority to subpoena anyone in and ask for information. He does, if you agree with me on this, he does not have the authority to subpoena outside the judicial branch. That's does, current employees? He can subpoena current employees. So if you have left, the probation department can't be subpoenaed. Is that what you're saying? I would argue that's consistent with my position, that what, what, you can't be subpoenaed. So why subpoena. would you need to issue a writ summons or other processes to somebody who is already your employee? You wouldn't necessarily so, need to. It would so, be a last resort. So you wouldn't have to. You wouldn't so, have so to. So by implication, isn't the issuance of, of writ summonses and other processes, uh, isn't it contemplated that that includes third parties? I suggest not for the, for the reasons I've stated, that it is simply outside the uh, definition. The definition of in third party individuals and corporations isn't included in that power. But to your question, Your Honor, certainly the first step would be to seek to interview people volitionally and in, in the judicial branch. And the court has the power as an employer, like private employers do, to insist as a condition of employment that people sit for interviews. The court also has the power to take sworn testimony as a condition of employment, but when it, and it also has the power under this statute to compel testimony from employees if need be and if they, it won't be given. And that's important. It's important because and there's a necessary and, and desirable provision check built into that subpoenaing of internal employees, which is important because if you went on to hold an employee in contempt, which, would, which could happen even in an internal proceeding where you're issuing a subpoena. If the person refuses to testify, you could hold them in contempt. This would be a check on that contempt power. It would only apply to subpoenas that are necessary or desirable. But, but isn't the essence of Chapter 211, Section 3, that the administration of justice is different from the internal gov governing of, say, a private corporation, and therefore we have powers that a private corporation would not have in doing an internal investigation? Well, it does give you subpoena power to employees. To that extent, it is different. But I don't think it is otherwise different. So you don't think, the, you don't think that the internal administration of justice is a, is a higher value in terms of the public interest than an internal investigation of wrongdoing within a private company? I might have written the statute differently, you might have written the statute differently, but this is the statute the legislature has provided, and I think it reflects that way. Okay, so, so your view then is that the legislature's intent here was that with regard to matters that are critical or essential to the internal administration of justice, the courts have no more power than a private corporation would have to investigate internal wrongdoing except that we can subpoena employees as opposed to simply ordering them to testify. Yes. Mr. Pucci, can I ask you another question? Do you, do you agree that the speech and debate challenge that you raise is premature and that really depends on the questions asked? Yes, I do. Okay. And with respect to your challenge to the subpoena, are you challenging the breadth of the subpoena here as well, particularly with respect to the range of documents requested? 
not in these papers, Your Honor. Thank you. But let, if I can move to, uh, if the court decides, if I've, if I've not persuaded you that, uh, well, that, uh, it's, uh, that, that it doesn't have the power to issue the subpoena, I see my time is up. It is. Thank you, Your Honor. I'll let you finish the sentence, though. Please. All right. Yes. It may be a long sentence. Please. Okay. Uh, Lots of semicolons. I, I, I think that, the, that, that at the heart of the issue is uh, how the court is going to apply the necessary or desirable clause in the same statute. And I think that uh, the court, uh, uh, independent counsel, doesn't, doesn't actually represent to you that the subpoena is necessary to his investigation. If you, if you, if you, if you look closely at his uh, pleadings, you'll see he doesn't actually even say it. But I think that uh, on, on its face, given that the lack that 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 lack of, of vermin, I think you could quash the subpoena. But I think beyond that, you I think it's up to this court to decide if it's necessary or desirable, and that takes takes you into a searching inquiry, uh, and it can happen in any way by a way of an interim report, which I suggested, by way of meetings. I mean, it's not up to me to decide how you would decide if it's necessary and desirable, but I submit it's up to you to decide that. And there's a vast amount of information which Attorney Ware has, has accumulated here, which would suggest that whatever the goals are, if it's, if it's to identify or reform the probation, hiring, and promotions practices, there is a vast amount of information that he already has. And you have to get that information to weigh whether Petrolati's information actually is going to be significant. It's going to be necessary. It's going to be desirable. You can't simply, without the record, make that decision. So I would urge the court in the first instance, to make a finding that there's been no averment of necessity or desirability, but if you get past that, to wade into this in the rare instance that's before the court. This is not an instance that's going to be repeated often or perhaps ever uh, in the court, but it calls upon the court to make its own weighing of necessity in its own weighing of desirability. And you can only do that with a record that isn't yet before you and only attorney Ware has. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Good morning, and may it please the court. Kevin Martin on behalf of the independent counsel uh, who has joined me at counsel table. Uh, I would like to start, your honors, with the last point that was raised uh, by counsel for the petitioner which is the issue of whether this court itself must make a determination as to whether the subpoena is, is necessary or desirable. And I, I want to emphasize the or in, the, in there, because at one point I believe I heard counsel for the petitioner say that the subpoena must be necessary, and, and that is not the standard. If the subpoena is desirable, it, it still may issue. Uh, I believe that under uh, Chapter 211, Section 3, this court, in fact, does not need to make that decision, at least in the way that counsel for the petitioner has argued it. Uh, chapter 211, Section 3 is a broad grant of authority to this court, not only to issue writs and summonses and, and processes, but also to adopt such directions and uh, rules and uh, other standards governing an investigation such as this. And in the court's May 24th order, uh, it, it did uh, retain independent counsel and granted independent counsel the authority to issue subpoenas. Um, I believe the court did that because it selected somebody who, based on his experience and his judgment, uh, the court trusted to exercise the subpoena power responsibly. And in this instance, uh, I believe that's exactly what has been done. Uh, if you look at the Boston Globe story, which came out the day before this investigation was initiated, uh, there were few politicians whose names are more prominent in that story than Representative Petrolati, uh, the petitioner today. Uh, it makes perfect sense and is completely reasonable for the independent counsel to decide that questioning Representative Petrolati concerning what information he may have concerning the hiring and promotion processes within the probation department is both uh, necessary to this investigation, but is certainly desirable for purposes of this investigation. Uh, there may be- But how do you address um, <clears throat> Mr. Pucci's argument that we have no authority <clears throat> to issue subpoenas to anyone outside of the court system, essentially? I'm not sure that, that Mr. Pucci's argument concerning the distinctions between paragraph one and paragraph two uh, really makes any sense. If you look at, it, essentially his argument is, well, individuals are not mentioned in paragraph two, therefore you cannot subpoena individuals outside of the judiciary. There's no distinction drawn between paragraphs one and two about whether the people receiving these uh, processes or, or summonses 
are within or without the judiciary. Taken to its logical extension, theoretically under paragraph two, you could not subpoena individuals within the judicial branch either. I don't know who you would actually be able to summon under his reading of paragraph two based on his emphasis of the lack of the word individual. Do you agree that paragraph two is the operative paragraph or do you think both of them are? I think there's an argument that both are. Certainly paragraph two is the broader paragraph and if this fits anywhere, it'll fit within paragraph two. However, under paragraph one, there's a semicolon in the middle of that paragraph. So the court is allowed to correct errors in the first part of that paragraph. The second part of the paragraph, though, after the semicolon, refers broadly to issuing writs and summonses with respect to abuses within the judicial, the inferior courts. Traditionally, probation officers have fit within the inferior courts. And if there's an abuse in hiring those individuals, I think certainly paragraph one is broad enough to reach that issue. If we adopt your position, do you agree that there is an area of legislative activity that cannot be penetrated by pressing an individual legislator under oath and compelling him to testify about it? If you look at the case law, both this court and the Coffin case and subsequent cases, as well as the U.S. Supreme Court, there is obviously an area that we cannot get into. How do you define what that area is? I think the way this court and the U.S. Supreme Court have defined that area consists of official acts which actually lead to or could lead to the passage of legislation. And the examples which are frequently given by, again, this court and the U.S. Supreme Court consist of holding committee hearings, giving speeches, actually voting. However, if you look at cases, again, such as Coffin or the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Brewster, there is much activity which is undertaken by legislators which is not, quote unquote, legislative activity. And examples given in the Brewster case of such activity include the type of conduct which is at issue here. For example, calling other branches of government to try and get contracts issued to try and find jobs for people. I believe the U.S. Supreme Court used the word haranguing other branches of government. Although that is proper conduct for a legislator to engage in, it is not legislative conduct within the meaning of a speech and debate clause. Are you aware of any case in the country in which any court has ever said that fundraising, even legitimate fundraising, is protected by a legislative privilege? We are not, Your Honor. Because, again, the fundraising is not an actual official act which leads to legislation. The Brewster case, for example, is a good case to look at because there you had an allegation that a U.S. Senator was accepting bribes in exchange for a subsequent official act, a vote on legislation. Despite the fact there was a connection between the criminal conduct in that case, the accepting of the bribe, and later on an official act, the U.S. Supreme Court still held that the conduct in question, the acceptance of the bribe, was not covered by the speech and debate clause. So I take it, going back to your first point, the necessary and desirable nature of this subpoena, is it necessary and desirable that this summons issue? Is your argument that we need not make any further determination on that, either because where the investigation initiated or how it initiated plainly included the interview under oath of Representative Petrolati as something that would be desirable, or that we've somehow deferred all of that kind of decision making to independent counsel? I think both, Justice Cordy. I think both, if you look at the facts here, if the court itself had never appointed independent counsel and was considering this issue itself, I think it would need to draw the conclusion, based on even the publicly available facts, that a subpoena to Representative Petrolati would be necessary and desirable. Again, given his core role, at least in the story, that came out the day before this investigation was launched. I think, however, also, the way I read his argument is that, as a matter of law, this court itself must make that determination, that it cannot, in a sense, delegate that to independent counsel. And I would suggest that under the broad authority given this court, under Chapter 211, Section 3, this court can, in fact, delegate that decision making to an independent counsel. And I believe that is, in fact, what this court's May 24th order accomplished. Well, surely we can ask the question internally. Would you suggest we can ask the question internally? Well, the independent counsel is- Is any further work in this regard necessary and desirable? I don't believe the court needs to do that. I think, based on the publicly available facts, the only conclusion that could be reached is that 
obtaining testimony from Representative Petrolati is necessary and desirable. He, he suggests that we deliver some kind of interim report to the court. Uh, I'm not sure that anything that we would provide in an interim re report would, would move the court off of that conclusion. His, his theory essentially is, well, there, there may already be so much information, you, you don't need more. Uh, and I think that's, a, that's an incorrect assumption. Uh, much of what is at issue here uh, would involve conversations, for example, between Representative Petrolati and people within the probation department. Uh, he admitted, for example, in the press to making recommendations for hiring and promotion uh, for people in the probation department. Uh, it, you know, it, it's likely there are only two people in such conversations, and it's quite possible that the other party to such a conversation may have taken the Fifth Amendment, may have pled the Fifth Amendment, um, may have forgotten the conversation, uh, may have provided testimony concerning the conversation, and we need to confirm that testimony with Representative Petrolati. Uh, I, I really don't think there, there would be a, given Representative Petrolati's key or, or core place in the story that led up to this investigation, I, I can't imagine a situation where we decide, well, we, we just don't need his testimony anymore. So, so what, what you're, if, if I understand you're saying, um, the May 24th order delegates. It's not a delegation without the ability to review, but on the record here, um, uh, there is no cause to review at this point. I think on the record here, there's no cause to review at this point. That's right, Justice Botsford. Uh, I would also suggest that in, in terms of our, our reading of the statute and of the delegation, there may very well be a, a, a point at which, as, as we suggest in our opposition brief, a, a summons is so tangential to the purpose of the investigation or so plainly abusive that despite the delegation, the court would want right. to step no, that's, in. Yeah. But I think that's clearly not the, the case here. So it, it sounds as if you're essentially saying if, we, if it's within the scope of the investigation, and reasonably so, that deference should be given. <clears throat> yeah, well, yes, um, where the court has engaged independent counsel. Uh, I think it is important, though, to remember that the argument being made by uh, counsel for Representative Petrolati is that this is actually a limitation on the court, not on independent counsel, that the court itself could not decide that this is a, a necessary or desirable uh, subpoena. So in, in, in terms of deference, uh, I'm not really sure that that is part of his argument, uh, but if it is, I think this is a case where you should defer to the independent counsel's uh, judgment. <clears throat> If there are no further questions. Thank you, Council. Thank you.